的。See, I told you. You're welcome. Up close and personal with four. Cradinosaurus is one of the smallest ankylosaurid species that has ever been discovered. This small and heavily armored dinosaur lived during the late Cretaceous period, around 95 million years ago. It was first discovered in the late 90s by paleontologist Don Ziming during an expedition to the Sunjiawan Formation, located in northeastern China. These initial findings were scarce and offered very little information to paleontologists, but they were distinct enough from other fossils that they were designated as a new species. Acknowledging the huge impact of Michael Crichton's work through the novels Jurassic Park and The Lost World, the paleontological community designated the new species of dinosaur after his first name, called Crichtonsaurus bolini. Its generic name, honoring Michael Crichton, the man responsible for creating Jurassic Park, while the specific name Bolini honors Berger Bolin, a Swedish paleontologist who took part in several paleontological expeditions to China and described numerous Chinese ankylosaurs. Unfortunately, not much is known due to its limited remains, but based on these fossils, it was soon described as being a member of the subfamily Ankylosaurinae. However, it is unknown whether or not it possesses a tail club, which is a feature exclusive to the subfamily. Like other ankylosaurids, its fossils give evidence of having rows of bony spikes projecting from the animal's sides and bony knobs on its back. Cridensaurus also had a skull that was low, broad, and box-like, with osteoderms that were fused to the skull. The discovery of Cridensaurus has provided important new evidence about the thiobiversity of the late Cretaceous Sunjiawan formation and our understanding of dinosaur evolution during this period. This geological formation has yielded diverse dinosaur remains, including ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, and titanosaurs, as well as a newly discovered theropod, which is the first for this formation. This formation was unique for having no theropod fossils on record until very recently when four dinosaur teeth related to a tyrannosaurid were discovered. This tyrannosaurid would be the reason why Pridensaurid sported such an armored frame, which made it a difficult picking for this predator would have to get its jaws around its heavily armored body, as well as having to defend itself from a powerful tail clip. While there was no Indominus rex versus Ankylosaurus battle, an encounter between Cridensaurus and this unknown Tyrannosaurus would have been a sight to behold. Overall, Cridensaurus is a relatively small and obscure dinosaur, but its name has become popular among fans of Michael Crichton's novels and the Jurassic Park franchise. Unfortunately, it hasn't made any appearances in any of the Jurassic Park movies or video games until Jurassic World Evolution 2, making it the first time it has ever physically appeared in any Jurassic Park game. It was also then included in the mobile game Jurassic World Primal Ops as a dinosaur that can be rescued in the game, but altogether, while Cridensaurus may not be as well known as some other dinosaurs, it remains an interesting and unique example of the diverse range of prehistoric life that once roamed the Earth. If you'd like to keep learning more about Cridensaurus, then this video will feature a complete paleontological profile of the Crichton lizard and then attempt to recreate its environment in the game Jurassic World Evolution 2. Cridensaurus is a small herbivorous ankylosaurid that lived during the late Cretaceous period, approximately 95 million years ago. So far, they've been discovered living in the Sunjiawan Formation in what is now northeastern China. The fossils found so far are rather subpar, consisting of a jaw, teeth, skull, and pieces of backbone and armor. There is not much that can be deduced from these remains, and there has been some additional confusion due to two other ankylosaurid species found in the same formation. All that can be said so far is that Cridensaurus was amongst the smallest of the ankylosaurids, measuring about 10 feet long and weighing around 1,000 pounds. It had a broad and low slung body, short legs with a dense skull. Its most distinctive feature was its thick, bony armor which covered most of its body. Its armor was made up of rows of bony plates called osteoderms, which were embedded into the skin and overlapped each other, sort of like shingles on a roof. Some ankylosaurids had a series of sharp bony spikes on their sides and clubs on their tail that they could use to defend themselves against predators. While evidence of these have yet to be found for Cridensaurus, one can assume that they might have had them as well. 
Cridensaurus also had a unique adaptation in its skull, which was flattened and elongated, forming a bony cap for the back of the head and its neck. This cap, called a cervical half ring, protected the neck from attacks and helped support the weight of the heavy skull. It can be assumed that like other ankylosaurs, Cridensaurus bones in the tail vertebrae, skull, and other parts of its body were fused together, increasing their strength. These characteristics show us how pressured its condition was and how intense the predation was back then, at least still surviving until the KT extinction. Cridensaurus must have experienced such intense predation back then and it may have protected itself with its tail and armor as a defense against predators. As a slow herbivore because of its stumpy legs, its tank-like physique offered an advantage to running which most likely meant that Cridensaurus frequently dealt with encounters by engaging in combat. It can also be said that Cridensaurus was a herbivorous dinosaur based on its physical characteristics. It is believed that it was adapted to eating low-grain vegetation such as ferns, cycads, and conifers. Its broad and robust skull was well suited for cropping and grinding tough plant material. Its teeth were broad and flattened, which suggests it was adapted for chewing rather than slicing or tearing. Cridensaurus likely had a large digestive system to help break down the tough plant material, and its broad body and short legs suggest that it was a slow-moving dinosaur that spent much of its time grazing for food. Overall, Cridensaurus were well adapted to a herbivorous lifestyle, and their unique armor and defensive adaptations likely evolved to help protect them from predators while they were feeding. And a recent discovery in 2023 reported that the possible sounds ankylosaurids may have made were bird-like vocalizations based on the finding of a fossilized larynx from the ankylosaur Panicosaurus. It can be assumed that Cridensaurus may have produced a similar vocalization. Based on the fossil record, it is believed that Cridensaurus went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period, around 66 million years ago, along with the rest of the non-avian dinosaurs. The cause of the extinction is still a subject of debate, but it is generally accepted that it was likely caused by a combination of factors, including climate change, volcanic activity, and an asteroid impact. Cridensaurus was first discovered in the late 1990s in the Sunjiawen Formation near Liaoning Province, located in northeastern China. In 2002, the holotype fossils of jaw, teeth, skull, and pieces of backbone and armor were finally described and named as Cridensaurus bolini by dinosaur specialist Don Ziming, lead researcher at Beijing's Institute of Vertebrae Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. He chose a generic name to honor the author of Jurassic Park and the Lost World because of the popularity of Crichton's work in China. The specific name of Bolini honors Berger Bolin, a Swedish paleontologist who took part in many paleontological expeditions to China and described a good number of ankylosaurid species. As well as his work on dinosaur and prehistoric mammals, Bolin was part of the group that established the existence of Peking Man. The Peking Man discovery is celebrated as a major step forward in the theory of human origin and evolution. Years later, two species of Cridensaurus were identified by Chinese paleontologists, though some doubts have been cast on the validity of these finds. Canadian paleontologist Victoria Arbor pointed out that the designation of these additional specimens could not be justified because of a lack of overlapping material. Arbor also did not find any unique traits in the holotype itself, concluding that Cridensaurus bolini was a nomen dubium a name which describes a fossil with no unique diagnostic feature and which therefore cannot accurately be assigned a classification. Arbor also stated that at least one partial skeleton attributed to Cridensaurus bolini should be moved to the second species, Cridensaurus benziensis. However, it was noted that there are clear differences in the shoulder blades of the known fossil specimens and that itself does support the presence of at least two Ankylosaurus species in the Sunjiawan formation. A later study by Arbor and Curry saw Cridensaurus benziensis removed from the genus and used to establish its own genus which subsequently became known as Cridenpelta. The discovery of Cridensaurus is just one example of the ongoing work of paleontologists around the world, who continue to excavate and study fossils in order to better understand the diversity in the history of life on Earth. By studying the fossils of Cridensaurus and other dinosaurs, paleontologists can reconstruct their anatomy, physiology, and behavior, and gain insights into the ancient ecosystems in which they lived. Cridensaurus lived in the Sunjiawen Formation located in present-day northeastern China during the late Cretaceous period around 95 million years ago. 
the climate in this region was characterized by high humidity and precipitation, which supported lush vegetation and a diverse array of animal life. This was a time of mainly warm, mild climates with remains of palm trees found as north as Alaska. The rest of the environment consisted of dense tropical forests and open woodlands with new types of flowering plants and trees living among the dominant conifers. However, this region also contained some pockets of semi-desert with scrubby vegetation, and over time these pockets would eventually become grasslands. This Cretaceous period saw a dramatic change in plant life with the evolution of flowering plants and eventually grasses. But until the end of this period, these flowering plants would be outnumbered by conifers, ferns, and ginkgo surviving from the Jurassic. In the Sunjiawan formation, ferns were shaped providing plants that were abundant in forests and a vital food source for many herbivorous dinosaurs. Needle-leafed conifers such as a sequoia were the dominant trees in this environment, but broad-leaf trees were getting more common. This environment also contained a now extinct fern named Temskia. With its huge fibrous false trunk and covering of leaves, Temskia probably resembled a young cedar or redwood rather than the species of tree fern. Around this time, many landscapes were dotted with early flowers such as magnolia and water lilies, signaling the dominance of angiosperms. There are several features that distinguish angiosperms from other seed plants, but the most obvious is the flower itself. Unfortunately, not all plant species would flourish. As flowering plants, including trees, gained ground at the end of the Cretaceous period, ginkgos and cycads were becoming rare. With all of this foliage, and at a height of just over 6 feet tall, Cridensaurus fed on low-lying vegetation in forests and surrounding grasslands. It tended to stay away from other species of dinosaurs, preferring to live in small herds. The environment of the Sunjiawan Formation was a warm, humid habitat with high precipitation, lush vegetation with pockets of semi-desert and a diverse array of animal life. This environment has yielded a variety of fossils that have significantly contributed to our understanding of the evolution of life in this location during the late Cretaceous period. The lush environment of the Sunjiawan Formation allowed for a wide variety of animals to make their home. As a result, this formation has yielded a range of fossilized organisms including dinosaurs, small mammals, birds, and insects, providing valuable insights into the ecosystems and biodiversity of this environment. Dinosaurs believed to have coexisted with the Cridensaurus include other ankylosaurids such as Lianingosaurus, the smallest complete ankylosaurus specimen found, and Chuanquilon, a slightly bigger ankylosaur that was once believed to be Lianingosaurus, but over the years, enough differences were noticed that finally led to the naming of Chuanquilon. The last ankylosaurid, Cridempelta, is the described second species of Cridensaurus benziensis. Large herds of hadrosaurs also live in this formation. Hadrosaurs like the 23 foot long Jinxosaurus roamed the landscape with other hadrosaurs like the Shuangnosaurus, an iguanodont dinosaur whose size is still uncertain due to lack of fossil remains. Additionally, Cridensaurus also share the formation with Borealosaurus, a 40 foot titanosaurid seropod that has been interpreted as being potentially related to the better known Opistosilicodia. As for the four isolated teeth recently found in the Sunjiawan formation, they have yet to be identified, but some paleontologists believe they might belong to a Tyrannosaurid named Eutyrannus, which is notable for being the largest known feathered dinosaur. However, without more fossils, it is difficult to determine the exact species of this theropod dinosaur. The discovery of these teeth is significant because theropods had not been previously found in the Sunjiawan formation. In summary, the Sunjiawan Formation in Liaoning, China has yielded a diverse range of dinosaur fossils including ankylosaurids, titanosaurids, hadrosaurs, and a newly discovered theropod, which is a first for this formation. While famous for being named after Michael Crichton, the author of Jurassic Park, Crichtonsaurus hasn't made any appearances in any of the Jurassic Park movies. The first time it ever physically appeared in any Jurassic Park game was in Jurassic World Evolution 2, being one of five dinosaurs available in the deluxe edition of the game. It also had a small cameo appearance in the Jurassic World Primal Ops mobile game, becoming a common dinosaur that can be rescued in the game. By far its biggest cultural impact has been its name. Recognizing the huge impact of Michael Crichton's work through Jurassic Park and the Lost World novels, the paleontological community named Crichtonsaurus in honor of him. Dr. Street Brusati of the Edinburgh University mentioned that Jurassic Park played a crucial role in transforming paleontology 
from a rather dry academic topic carried out by old men in academia to a diverse field of study practiced by scientists around the world. Paleontologists were also thankful because Jurassic Park had influenced and increased the public interest in dinosaurs. The film's realistic portrayal of dinosaurs inspired many museums to feature dinosaurs in their exhibits, leading to a rise in museum attendance. Jurassic Park also had an impact on the way paleontology was viewed as a science. Before the film, paleontology was primarily studied in geology departments. However, after the release of Jurassic Park, biologists recognized that dinosaurs were once living organisms and began studying them as such. This shift led to paleontology being moved from some geology departments to biology departments. Finally, Michael Crichton's work led to the birth of a new generation of paleontologists that continues to this day. When Michael Crichton was made aware of how Dr. Don Zeming named Crichtonsaurus in honor of him, he commented that for a person like me, this is much better than an Academy Award. I'm honored that he's named a new species for me. Crichtonsaurus is unique because its naming was a gift from the paleontological community, acknowledging Michael Crichton for the impact and influence that he had on their livelihood. Jurassic Park had increased the public's interest in dinosaurs and paleontology in a way that paleontologists had never imagined. They would no longer be seen as antiquated people studying a boring topic, but rather as these modern scientists that get to study these amazing dinosaurs for a living. It's been 30 years since the release of Jurassic Park, and those who watched it from a young age are now entering the stage where many of them are now becoming paleontologists, having been inspired by seeing dinosaurs being brought to life on the big screen. All that would not be possible without Michael Crichton, and having a dinosaur named after him is an exceptional way to honor his contribution. Hey everyone, welcome to my park and to those who have been following me along, you can see that I went ahead and updated to the new map. We got the huge map, so now we're going to have even more space. And I went ahead and split our enclosures to our right hand side. We got our carnivores and our herbivores are going to be on this other side right here. And we're going to go ahead and work on our Crichtonsaurus habitat, which I have reserved right here to work in progress. And based on what we've uh, read here, I'm going to go ahead and do a bit of a woodland, dense woodland area right here. This area is going to be reserved for our vehicle, so we're going to try to make sure that nothing really heavy is here. Um, go ahead and transition this middle area to the grassland areas. As you know, Cretaceous period, we had our grasses kind of growing in, so we're going to add those here. And here at the end, we'll add that semi-arid uh, uh, desert-like climate that um, it also shared with. So let's start off by working with our water. Let's go ahead and add our water here. Um, you know, split the habitat, make it a bit more unnatural. And right here, we don't really have to do too much. If you want, you can just bring this guy a bit out and mess with it. But since we're going to reserve this for desert, let's go ahead and move this over here a bit more. And I think that'll do well. Um, let's actually do one little cut right here. After that, let's go ahead and just start working on our forest. So let's go ahead and do some fibrous ground cover. You can also do the grass and shrubs, but I think I'd want to do a bit more heavy. So let's go ahead and do these. And this is going to be our dense woodland habitat. We don't really have to worry about the terrain, terrain's fine right now. Um, now with that, let's go ahead and go over here and let's go ahead and put down some of these uh, Mediterranean trees. We can also work with the other ones, the forest, but let's work with these first. So we're going to make it kind of dense, you know, go ahead and make sure, you know, it's up to your liking, but I usually try to keep it this way. That way you can also enjoy the animals. So after that, we're gonna go back up here and work with this guy. Let's put these guys over here on the fringes of where our forest is going to end. After that's done, um, let's go ahead and work with these guys. And these are gonna be like our woodwoods and, and um, trees that were around this time. So we'll add a couple of these. And 
after that, I wanted to go down to the taiga one because they have these medium trees that are, I think, perfect height. So let's work with these guys. You can make it as dense as you want, but I also, you know, want to make sure that people get to enjoy these uh, dinosaurs. We're gonna go ahead and do put a couple more. You can go mess around with more. Go even lower. We can go ahead and do that. And just kind of spares them around randomly. We don't want to make it look too, um, you know, too unnatural. Uh, nevertheless, though, let's go back to our environment and finish it off with a little bit of, of these. You know, and I think it looks pretty good. Um, that's pretty good right there. It looks nice and dense. After that, let's work with our um, vehicles here. So. You know, they're going to be coming and going, so let's go ahead and put our dirt here. Signifies, you know, how much they've been coming to this area. And also the dinosaurs themselves are going to kick up, kick up uh, the grass and, you know, leave dirt underneath due to how heavy these things were. So go ahead and put some dirt around. To signify, you know, that they've been kicking up the dirt, especially around right here. The area is most frequently by the vehicles, by, by the way. Um, after that, let's work on our blast on areas. And this is perfectly, because that's just what we can go ahead and put down these guys, the grass and shrubs. So just go ahead and just sparsely put them around, because we're also going to put down some trees. And the rocks as well. So after that, go back to our decorations and let's go ahead and put down these um, Mediterranean, yes, these medium trees right here. These make perfect, I think, um, grassland, woodland habitat kind of um, environment. Yeah, so this is like our open woodland, so we're not going to add too many trees. Um, we'll add just a couple of low trees like these guys. And this is kind of going to look like our little savanna-ish area. So we're going to add a bit more sand to this area, because this is where it's going to start turning into uh, the desert. So let's go down here to our sand. And let's start... Ooh, I think I put a bit too much. We'll go ahead and put in some... Uh, some dirt in a bit. There we go, it's starting to look, it's starting to turn around, it's starting to look good. And one thing I did forget, um, we'll go ahead and add a couple of hills. Um, you always want to have some hills here, you know, try to shape the environment a little bit. Don't make it just look too flat. I think that's pretty good, we can always uh, smooth it out. It's perfect, and then we can always raise it um, I think right here is okay. There we go. Um, after that, let's go ahead and finish with our sand environment. So, of course, it's going to be a bit more sand, not totally, completely desert, but. So we'll do this, and we're going to go ahead down here and go with these trees down here. Um, words of Desert, these um, small little trees, I like them. So we'll sparsely put these around. Um, you can always add a couple of palm trees, so we can always go ahead and do this. It looks really... Um, let's go ahead and add these guys too. After that, let's go ahead and add these guys. No, I wanted a medium-sized tree. These aren't it. I think it was Mediterranean. Well, that's where I was. Um, which one was it then? Was it? 
desert. No, these are the ones we just put down. Oh, it's down here on Temperate. Um, these small little bushy trees um, that look kind of dried out, but not quite. So these guys right here. So we'll add a couple of those around the habitat. And finish it off with adding some Tempskia, because there was Tempskia during this time. And let's go ahead and add it on our really heavy woodland area. So we'll add that. Um, aside from that, you can go ahead and add a couple of side cats here and there. We'll add them a couple here, you know, because they were side cats during this time. We gotta get the representation here. You can also add some ginkgos here and there, but you know, it's up to your preference. I'll go ahead and add them here in the densely woodland area. Um, and the last part you can do is add the flowering plants, which are, you know, the ornamental shrubs, I guess you could say. There are a couple of flowering flowers that kind of pop out there. Um, so you can go ahead and, um, you know, go ahead and put those down because they were, um, this was the start of flowering plants. So go ahead and just put them throughout your habitat to represent that this is the late Cretaceous period. And with that, you should be done. Let's actually go ahead and add our rocks. And after that, we'll add our Crichtonsaurus, and we should be good to go. Let's add a couple of random resident rocks. And some temperate rocks here in the middle. And I like to bunch them, put them in clusters. That way, you know, most rocks, I guess, in nature tend to be kind of bunched together so why not here so we'll add one more pile and I think that's gonna be good enough um, and then finish it off here with some um, Mediterranean rock here and uh, that way you can kinda notice where they are Yeah, but after this we should be done and this should be a habitat that's pretty closely related to um, the habitat of the Sun Jiawen formation that Kratensaurus lived in so that being said this is the finished product you guys let me know what you guys think okay This heavily armored dinosaur with its white tank-like body and short legs makes Cridensaurus a beautiful but deadly addition to your Jurassic Park. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. See you in the next one.